is on, I guess. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and, uh, and good morning. Um, uh, my praise will be more effusive, Mr. Hoyt, but uh, with 10 minutes, I'm going to get to the questions. But thank you for all of your work and the excellent work of your staff uh, and those in the policy branch. Um, so I want to start with uh, buildings. Uh, and thank you for pulling out the emissions uh, uh, related to electricity consumption by buildings so that you, we get a fairer picture. And when you do that, uh, really 25% of the emissions uh, can be accounted for by buildings uh, when you count the emissions related to the energy they consume, uh, according to your numbers here. So I'm always concerned about missed opportunities and, and there, there are big ones with buildings with, because they're, they're sunk infrastructure. You, know, you build a commercial building or an apartment building or even a house uh, and uh, the, the carbon footprint of that based on its energy consumption is there for some time until you get to the point where you might want to renovate. So um, uh, right now, I understand that, say, the commercial buildings we're seeing going up around the province these days are being built to the standards of energy efficiency contained in the 2010 Build National Building Code. Um, the 2020 National Building Code is due to be completed this spring along with the 2020 National Energy Code, which is substantially uh, improved in terms of uh, the energy efficiency standards that had to be met. Um, what is, and, and, and we have the commitment here in the plan to adopt the latest National Energy Code and building codes uh, in New Brunswick. So. Are, are we missing opportunities because of our reliance on old building codes and are we going to increase the, um, the, 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 the speed at which uh, the new national building codes and energy codes are adopted in province? So thank you, Mr. Kuhn. I, I think as you mentioned, the, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the 2020 code uh, for buildings as well as the 20 code, 2020 code for energy are, are sort of pending. And so um, what will, you know, one, one of the things that I can say is that from the provincial side of things, when we, uh, when we do look at adoption again, it will be adopting sort of uh, the, the, uh, both the energy code and the building code sort of at the same time. Um, so we're waiting right now to see the timing around that, uh, that federal um, or the national, uh, the national codes. And obviously New Brunswick has made a commitment to sort of adopt those within a time frame that's reasonable for the province. And that sort of takes into account the training and the, and the, and the what have you. So, um, you know, we're, we're hopeful that we'll be able to see those codes come forward from the national side of things. And then that we'll be able to see those adopted on the provincial side of things in a timely manner. Um, and I think that you've got some, you know, there's some present energies that are coming in later through the, uh, the, the experts that you have here that can, can talk a little bit about more about that in terms of what those, uh, what those challenges might be, uh, as well as the opportunities. So um, I, I agree there's an opportunity there and we're, and we're hopeful that, um, that those things will in the future be something that sort of drives us towards more efficiency on our building stock. Okay, thank you. Um, I do understand. Am I right to say that the provinces have all agreed um, uh, with the federal government to adopt national building codes uh, within two years of their completion? I don't think it's fair to say that all provinces have done have done that. I think it's uh, you know there's there's a significant number that have, um, and uh, and I think that that's the overall intent is to try and and try and drive to that. I'm not uh, I, I'm not able myself to say whether or not that's a, something that's a blanket commitment that's been made by provinces, but it's definitely the intent to adopt them in a uh, in a timely manner. And two years is is the time frame that often gets talked about. Okay, thank you. I want to move on to transportation uh, because that is a significant um, source of, of uh, carbon pollution. Um, and uh, we haven't seen really tremendous improvements uh, since 2015, I guess a 10% reduction in emissions from passenger vehicles uh, over that time. Um, um, but uh, uh, lots more needs to be done. So I guess uh, um, my question on that is, uh, twofold um, what what are the opportunities for um, within the concept of a carbon neutral government for government to play a role as and, um, and leading by example in terms of cutting emissions related to their transportation um, and uh, and uh, related to that government has said that there is work going on on a public transportation strategy and I'm wondering if you can 
speak to how that might um, contribute to reducing transportation emissions. Okay, thanks. Um, so you're right. Um, and I think the first thing that I point out is that, you know, the challenges that New Brunswick has in terms of the transportation uh, emissions and, and our and our ability to reduce is, is not necessarily unique to us. When you look across a lot of jurisdictions, um, you know, transportation is a significant portion of our emissions. And I think we're all challenged with the uh, with the, the 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 ways in which to reduce that. Obviously, when you have provinces that have a significant um, urban population, that there's there's often uh, more opportunities within those urban centers than there are in, uh, in 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 rural areas. In a province like New Brunswick, that has a fairly rural makeup, even within our urban centers, I would argue are, are sort of more, more rural in terms of uh, in terms of when we're thinking about from transportation emission. Um, we're going to present. We're going to continue to be presented with significant challenges. So, um, you know, I, I think as I mentioned within the presentation, the real opportunity here is to is to look at zero emission vehicles. Um, the feds are going to drive some of that with the requirement to have light duty vehicles in place uh, zero emissions by 2035. Um, it will be a question of you know what's the speed with this, with adoption. You know one of the things that we've seen as a bit of a challenge with um, through COVID is supply chain related issues, um, and you know what that looks like as well as there's some you know I think everyone's heard there's some challenges going on right now with the with the uh, we U.S. legislation um, that may put some significant uh, pressures on on Canada in terms of access to those vehicles. So, so that's I think some of the bigger picture from a GMB perspective. Um, you know the the province has undertaken is committed to looking at you know ways in which we can um, can green our our fleet. Um, you know where that makes sense and and which vehicles. Um, and uh, and and I think that you know as as you mentioned the province can play. A lead role there. Um, there's uh, there's actions. I think if you look at, you know, what the climate change fund and some of the projects that have been funded um, in this fiscal that are looking at ways in which we can do that. So it, you know, I don't. One of the things that we will be looking at, obviously, through this plan, is you know, what does that look like and what does that commitment look like? Uh, but there's definitely an opportunity there. Um, in terms of the transportation side, uh, yes, there's been you know some work done. I, I don't myself have an, uh, have an update on that for you, Mr. Kuhn. Um, you know, obviously, uh, public transportation can can play a role in reducing emissions. Um, I don't have a figure rate on my fingertips in terms of what what it could play in in terms of um, in terms of New Brunswick. Um, it would be. Uh, I would I would argue that it's probably slightly lower than in some of other areas simply because of our, our of our, our rural makeup. It will be an important component to consider. Is it going to be the thing that will drive the majority of, of emissions reductions? Probably not. So uh, in in the work on both mitigation and adaptation, I'm, I expect you've done a, a number a number of studies looking at uh, to support implementation of mitigation measures and uh, and uh, adaptation measures. Uh, are those are those studies available? In which uh, in which context? We've we've done a lot of um, we've done a lot of work, sort of with uh, on the adaptation side. A lot of that work has been primarily with uh, supporting communities, and so um, you know a lot of those things are done through the Environmental Trust Fund. So all of those all of those reports and and the and the final reports on the adaptation side there with the communities and adaptation planning are either publicly available through the municipalities and their and their websites as well as um, as well as through the environmental trust fund uh, a lot of those uh, you know and, and there's also the work that's been done in municipalities through the partners for climate protection to looking at um, at uh, at GHG reductions as well um, you know the uh, in terms of other reports I mean we, we do have a number of reports that we've looked at over time in terms of possibilities for uh, for emission reduction. Um, I don't have a you know a list of them sort of right at my fingertips, and and some of them are are out in the public realm, and some of them are ones that we have uh, that we've used internally uh, to help inform our our own work and and. Uh, um, you know, in, in behind the scenes, but there isn't, um, you know, there isn't sort of one study that I can point to that would say that that is going to, um, you know, answer all of those questions on an adaptation or a mitigation side. So, have there been studies to look at scenarios for uh, reducing emissions related to transportation over the next uh, ten years or so? Uh, there have been. We have. We have. Um, we have looked at 
options through some of the modeling that we've done in terms of looking at future opportunities, uh, both uh, you know for uh, from now till 2030 uh, on the transportation side. Yes, um, and uh, and and you know the challenge that we often sort of run into with a lot of that is that. A lot of the assumptions that are coming through those modeling exercises are based based on sort of national averages, and it's also always a challenge to sort of you know pick out what's the new forensic reality within them. So yes, we've we've looked at components of that. We have conversations with with uh, with folks who are uh, who are involved in in sort of this this space. Um, but again, it's always trying to take and, and looking at okay, so what does the what does that mean from a new forensic perspective, and what does that mean for a new forensic reality? And with respect to uh, your comment and one Thank of the final you, Mr. slides. Thank you, Mr. Kuhn. Your time has expired.